The force that came to relieve us was not impressive. It consisted of a pair of stugs, one with smoke pouring from its exhausts, a panzer four, and a single panther. These were to guard both the north and south borders of the crossing point, together with two 80 di Metito guns towed by half-tracks and about 100 infantry. In a few hours, these units too would join the Exodus West and be replaced by units from further back in the pocket until the entire mass of men, civilians and machines in the Kessel crept westward like a caterpillar, coiling itself up one step at a time and then uncoiling as it moved. The mass of people and material moving across the autobahn was colossal. In any minute, several hundred men, women and children would emerge from the shadows of the heath, bunch up on the edge of the road, look quickly left and right, as if checking for traffic, and then dash across, disappearing off towards the railroad line in the distance. The sparks and glow of exhausts moved among them, as motorcycles, half-tracks and the few remaining cars and trucks made the crossing too. The Reds did not attack this point immediately with panzers or troops, but they began a bombardment which burst in slow, random patterns across the autobahn, scattering groups of people or sending vehicles flying end over end. Nobody knew where the next explosion would fall, or whether they would be the next to be hit, or if they would die or be left behind as wounded, like the many injured troops and civilians who were lying in the shadows on the grassland, crying out not to be abandoned. Our panther rejoined the Capo's panther and the solitary panzer IV. The old panzer IV was screeching as it moved and fell behind us slowly as its power began to fail. As we moved away from the road, I looked back and saw the panzer being swallowed in the ranks of people trudging past it. Where once they would have climbed up on it, begging for a ride, now they seemed to know that the vehicle was crippled and they ignored it in their trek to the west. The Panzer IV commander, the old Panzer training man, came running after us, flagging us down. My fuel! he shouted. We have no spare fuel, I called down. I have barely enough for ten kilometres. But I have plenty, he shouted. I have a full tank. We began to reverse back to his machine. The story was an interesting one. His training unit had been equipped with panzers, which had been adapted to run on wood-burning carbon monoxide stoves instead of gasoline. But for several months, gasoline had continued to be delivered, and they had amassed a small reserve. We quickly pumped out every drop of fuel from the Panzer IV tanks and split it between the Capo's Panther and mine. It was not a large amount, but increased our range from 10 kilometres to 50 kilometres, enough in a straight line to cross the railroad and reach the Elbe. That was provided that we had no detours, climbed no hills, and made no bursts of speed in combat. I let the Panzer IV's trainee Panzer crew ride on my Panther's front plate, where the angle meant that only able-bodied people can hold on, and we took several walking wounded and civilians onto the hull top and deck. I put the training instructor himself in the empty radio man's compartment, crouching on the shattered seat with an MP40 and instructions to fire it through the broken gun mounting if needed. He seemed pleased enough with the arrangement. Then we headed west, in the semi-darkness, among the stumbling foot columns and the random explosions of the shells. My gunner rested his face on the gun sight and went still. I suspected he was asleep, but I thought that he deserved it. I stood up in the cupola as we swayed over the heathland, I could see no sign of a counter-attack by the Reds, although we were on the left flank and the land in that direction was empty and open. That did not make me confident. On the contrary, it was as if the Russians were now allowing us to break out from the Kessel, permitting us to stream out into the western plain. But what choice did we have? The Kessel was a trap, a noose. If this open land was another trap, it had not yet snapped shut. In the darkness, which was broken only by the flash of explosions and fires, accidents happened. We passed a motorcycle that had been run over by a panzer, the rider and the machine visible for one instant in the light of a shell burst, mangled together in the ground. Any functioning motor vehicle that stopped was set upon and stripped of remaining fuel and ammunition. In this situation, 
with the scarcity of gasoline, horses were becoming more valuable. From my turret, I saw a pair of Wehrmacht troops descend on a civilian two-horse cart, cut the traces and make off riding the horses, leaving the civilians to continue on foot. A senior Luftwaffe officer whose staff car had broken down threatened the driver of a horse-drawn field kitchen with a pistol, demanding a horse for himself. The officer was quickly disarmed by passing troops, and he began to make his way among the civilians, holding a suitcase. We passed a few isolated heathland houses, in some cases with occupants standing in the doorways, watching us mutely. In the light of the flares and burning vehicles along the road, we saw that some of these houses had fresh graves near them, and it was said that these were graves of civilians who had been killed by the Russians as they passed through in the days before. In the distance to the front, there were flashes and coils of tracer erupting into the sky, which I believed marked the point where the SS King Tigers were spearheading the movement to the west. As we grew closer, the movement of people faltered and slowed, as the vast bulk of the infantry were unwilling or unable to progress into combat. Many troops simply lay on the ground in the shadows, waiting for others to go forward and take part in the fighting for the advance. Among these were many officers, who stood sullenly, like children, their arms folded, refusing to give orders or to discipline their men. The civilian women mocked and cursed these officers, calling out that their menfolk had fought like true Germans. Indeed, it became common to see armed groups of civilian women wearing helmets and clutching carbines or Russian machine pistols, seeming determined to defend themselves and their children to the last. Leaving these miserable scenes behind, my panther approached the head of the column, closer to the sounds of firing and explosions. The capo's panther was just in front of me, and following his exhausts, we entered a plateau crossed by ditches and hedgerows, which we in the panzers avoided carefully for fear of losing a track. In the dim light, we halted at a group of panzer crews, standing around a Yag Tiger, one of the massive self-propelled guns built on the King Tiger platform. The huge vehicle, like a bunker on tracks, was immobilised, emitting thick smoke, and men were siphoning off its remaining fuel. The panzer crews greeted us with blank faces. By this stage, there were no salutes and formalities, and the distinctions of rank were being lost. There was little interest, too, in the differences between the original units or regiments that we had come from. We were all there at that point in time, and we had to combine to maximise our chances of the breakthrough. You have two panthers, one of them said to us. You will be useful. The railroad is ahead, but there's a blockade in front of it. If we can get over the railroad here, we drive straight on to the west. I know definitively that the Twelfth Army is there, after the railroad waiting for us. We have had messengers coming through, confirming this. But if we wait here, the Reds will simply destroy us at daylight. But why attack the blockade itself? the capo asked. Why not bypass it? To the north and south are anti-tank ditches and flooded canals. These are things that our forces prepared to hold back the Russians, and now the Russians are using them. There are red panzers hidden up and down there too. We could find a way through all that, but it would take hours, and by then the sun will be up. As soon as daylight comes, the red planes will cut us to pieces. The blockade is not our construction. The Soviets have built it in the past few days. Therefore, we believe it is a rushed piece of work, possibly not finished. We must break through it now. As we moved up to the front, the Jag Tiger was destroyed with a demolition charge that massive machine, the equivalent of two panthers in steel and resources, was simply left burning beside the road. The forces for attacking the railroad were our two panthers, a remaining King Tiger, several Stugs and some mobile 20 mm flak panzers which we called the Wirbelwind. These remarkable machines were quadruple 20 mm cannon in open turrets on a Panzer IV chassis, suitable for strafing ground targets as well as anti-aircraft fire. Their presence gave me confidence, but the sight of the infantry that was to accompany us was worrying. We had several dozen Fallschirmjager, the elite forces that we could trust to give their all. But they were supplemented with Volkssturm men and boys, 
the under-16s and over-50s, armed with Panzerfausts and carbines, completely untrained. There were several civilian police units too, and groups of panzer troops with no vehicles, artillerymen and flak gunners who had abandoned their guns in the breakout. Regular Wehrmacht troops were there, and a pioneer officer brought in another 50 or so from the column at gunpoint, ordering them to fight or face instant execution. This officer was backed up by a roaming gang, that is the word that came to my mind of Kettenhund men, SS men and pioneer troops, vicious-looking marauders who radiated a desperation to elude the Russian trap. Forcing the press gang troops forward to join the others, they dragged out one unwilling soldier, a lad of 18 or so, and executed him with a shot in the head. The others moved into the front line with grim faces. Dawn would come within an hour, and with it the red bomber planes and the revelation of the extent of the great column behind us. The officers told me that there were ten or twenty thousand people bunched up here, waiting to cross the railroad to get to the west. Perhaps a quarter of them were civilians or walking wounded. Daylight surely would bring a level of destruction on a scale that so far we had not witnessed even in the Kessel. There was no time for preparation or planning. With the aim of breaching the blockade that guarded the railroad, the single SS King Tiger lurched forward into the dark, with our panthers following in an arrowhead formation, the stugs beside us and the two whirlwind flak panzers following among the mix of infantry behind us. The railroad was on an embankment on the skyline, lit by the flames of burning vehicles. I could see its wide, straight line running left and right, and at its foot we had been told that the improvised blockade position consisted of bulldozed earth, logs and sandbags. The greatest danger would come when we breasted the railroad itself. As we rose up over the railroad tracks, our lower hulls would be exposed to whatever was beyond for a few seconds, and an alert Russian Paki gunner could put around through our forward transmission from below. Above the railroad line, the sky appeared to be tinted grey. Was dawn coming so early? The light suddenly brightened, and a long, intense beam shot up into the sky. Inside my panther, even in the heat and fumes, we all laughed at the sight of that beam. The Russians had switched on an anti-aircraft searchlight. My God, that will protect them from the mighty Luftwaffe, the loader muttered, peering at the sight through his periscope. When was the last time you saw the Luftwaffe? The panzer trainer called up from the hull. Was it Christmas or before? It seemed incredible that with their domination of the sky, the Reds would bother with an aerial searchlight. But then another beam joined the first, and then a third, and I could see that these were extremely powerful lights, sending long shafts of brilliant white light up into the smoky air above the railroad. The enemy strongpoint was still wrapped in shadows below it. As we closed to 500 metres, and there was no reaction from the blockade, the searchlight beams quivered, moved through the air, and then descended directly onto our panzers. Our laughter turned in a moment to shouts of pain and alarm. The lights were dazzling, brighter than any light I had seen before, surely more powerful than any normal anti-aircraft beam. They transformed the space in front of us into a wall of blinding fog, in which it was impossible to make out any perspective or dimensions. My driver slowed, and I used the magnetic compass to keep him driving straight ahead, hoping that the other vehicles would do likewise. Fear gripped my stomach and made my hands shake uncontrollably. We were lit up like showground targets, blind and lost. Over the din of our engine, I heard another vehicle move close to us, collide with our flank and then move off. Then the rapid, chattering fire of twenty Tausintel cannons told me that the Wirbel wind had moved in front and was shooting up at the searchlights. We entered a situation of complete anarchy and destruction, even by the standards of combat that I had seen in the east. We were hit by a pack round on our front plate, causing our transmission to shriek. At the same time, the blinding wall of light was cut in half, and I could dimly see flashes to our right as the whirlwind blasted its cannon along the railroad embankment. My vision was impaired by the light, and my retina held brilliant shapes that prevented me focusing properly. 
My gunner cursed and shouted that he had the same problem he could not focus on the gun sight. This was a new form of weapon from the Reds, a light so blinding that it prevented men from using their weapons. I ordered our driver to steer us to the right, out of the blinding light, into the area of darkness that the Wirbelwind had created. We were hit again by pack rounds, two slamming into our turret and blowing the periscope glass down onto me. I could now only see to the front, and there I thought I could make out a wrecked searchlight up on the embankment, and two more lights sweeping their beams randomly onto our forces. Machine gun and packy fire was coming from the blockade point, only a few hundred metres away. I saw the Wirbelwind's quadruple 20mm cannon tear a row of explosions along the top of the embankment, and then another one of the searchlights exploded in brilliant pieces and went dark. The remaining light continued operating, moving up and down the embankment and sweeping its blinding beam over our forces. We almost collided with the SS King Tiger, which was firing with a lowered gun onto the blockade, advancing a few metres between each shot. Unable to see anything else, I ventured my head up out of the cupola. The battle for the railroad was erupting in fits and starts as our men and machines threw themselves at the resistance points, cut down by the enemy guns and dazzled by the powerful light. Two stugs had been destroyed, and their crews were clamouring out, shielding their eyes against the light. These men were picked off one by one as they tried to jump clear by machine guns firing from the blockade. One stug exploded in flames, sending its tracks and wheels arching through the air for many metres. Our two Wirbelwinds were firing defiantly up onto the railroad line, where the remaining searchlight was flashing its blinding cone back and forth over us. Among all this, our infantry was charging the Soviet blockade, running into the light and explosions in ragged groups. I gave instructions to my gunner and aimed our gun roughly at the blockade, and fired our remaining high-explosive rounds into the sandbags and earthen walls. The timber and earth blew up, lifting the red occupants into the air in a jumble of bodies and debris. A Paik gun fired on us, the tracer deflecting off the front plate just a few metres below me. But then the capo's panther charged past us, firing at zero range until he rammed the blockade itself with his bow. His panther's tracks clawed madly at the mounds of earth, but sank into the debris that our shells had created, becoming stranded. Beside him, the King Tiger moved along the blockade, firing with his lowered gun into each aperture. I ordered my driver to ram the blockade, and we lurched onto the position as red machine gunners shot at us from either side, with their bullets smacking off our armoured hull. My driver used the differential expertly to rotate the panzer and crush the dug-in positions, and then, on my order, we began to mount the embankment beyond the blockade. That last high-powered searchlight began to turn on to us, and I saw that this was a device mounted on a T-34 chassis, with a huge projection disc bigger than any searchlight I had seen, even in the Reich. We reached the ridge of the embankment and rammed the machine before it turned its beam fully onto us, knocking it sideways. The T-34 hull span off down the slope on the other side of the ridge, with the powerful beam now directed west towards the red lines. Perhaps this saved us, because a storm of tracer rounds flew up at us from the land beyond, but all the shots went wide. The searchlight panzer caught fire and began to burn as its massive lens burst open and the light died. My panther gripped the stones of the railroad line itself, and I felt the thump of each railroad girder as we passed over the top and then we crashed down onto the obverse slope, where we knew nothing about the forces ranged against us. We ploughed to a halt on a slope of loose stones. My cupola periscopes were cracked and dusty, making forward vision difficult. When I was sure that we were below the skyline, so that I was less of a target for snipers, I went up through the cupola to see what was in front of us. Dawn was close, that much was evident. Not the false blinding dawn of the power searchlights, but a blue mark across the sky. Below us, red infantry was retreating, running from us over the earthworks which we Germans had built to defend the zone. In the distance, as the land fell away to the east, I saw a corridor of flames and explosions which surely marked the limit of the 12th Army's advance. 
If we could make it to that corridor, we would have a chance of making it onward to the Elba. The dawn light rose as the remaining vehicles and infantry of our assault group reared up over the railroad lines and slithered down the slope. None of the Stugs had survived. One Virbal Wind was intact, and another joined us as a chassis tractor with its open turret blasted away. The SS King Tiger laboured over the ridge in the grey light, with flames licking around its engine bay. The huge machine shuddered and ground to a halt, its tracks sinking into the loose stones as its crew extinguished the flames. The infantry had survived at a rate of perhaps 40% or less. The Fallschirmjager came in ones and twos over the railroad, shouldering their guns and with their faces set under masks of dust. The Volkssturm people came supporting each other, trailing their Panzerfausts behind them, boys carrying the old men and vice versa. The Wehrmacht troops came over with their Kettenhund gang behind them, the soldiers reduced to a platoon and their escorts down to two men. With this ragged bunch of men and machines, we had crossed the last barrier that remained before the Elbe and our salvation. But what of the Carpo? Despite the urgency, I ran back over the railroad to look for him. The Capo's panther was stuck fast on the eastern side of the ridge, its tracks ripped off and its transmission burned out. In five minutes, we had drained its fuel and ammunition and added them to my panther, and then we blew the panther up with a demolition charge. I looked back to see the engine blown out through the grills. Around it, a great mass of people was already starting to make its way west, the thousands of foot soldiers, stragglers and civilians that had emerged from the Kessel overnight. I installed the capo and his crew on my panther, and we followed the single King Tiger as it spearheaded the way to the west. Behind us, the sprawling column followed at a running pace. Horses, carts, men and women on foot, and numerous motorcycles, a few cars and hanomags. I could not count the people, but I guessed at four or five thousand that I could see with many more evidently still behind them. For many of these people, though, their journey was about to end. As the dawn broke, the sky behind us to the east erupted in red, not the red of sunrise, but the orange and black explosions of Katyusha incendiary rockets. The explosions were tearing across the mass of people advancing over the railroad, sending men, women and children flying through the air in flames, throwing horses, wagons and vehicles end over end in spouts of fire. The people close to the railroad began to run like demons, the wounded dragging themselves, soldiers throwing away their guns, civilians becoming trampled in the mob. The breakout was being sealed by the bombardment, with a line of pure fire that prevented any further Germans coming west. Before I turned away, I saw a single horse charge through the wall of flames, streaming fire, his rider dead in the saddle. Nothing else came through that curtain of death, except pieces of debris and burning liquid. Those few thousand of us that had crossed the railroad quickly accelerated, fleeing the incendiary bombardment, knowing that each moment made it more likely that we would be caught in the firestorm, like those we left behind. Reaching the Elbe Our column of a few thousand now moved through a landscape seemingly untouched by the war. There was no road, so our panzers moved slowly between copses of oaks and orchards of apple and pear trees, hiding as best we could in each area of cover before dashing on to the next. The foot traffic followed us, but the human column was thinning out as people gave up in exhaustion or from their wounds, and lay down to accept their destiny. In the occasional house that we found, the civilian occupants urged our troops to enter and remove their uniforms, and to put on the work clothes of absent menfolk. Some of our troops accepted the offer and disappeared into the houses. There was little attempt to stop them. We all knew that each person now had to face the end of the war as he or she best could. Small fires appeared in the yards of the houses, where uniforms and insignia were burned. Many of these houses took in women and children, who were too tired or fearful to continue, and many civilians left our column in this way. And yet, as the day continued, the sky overhead remained clear of Soviet aircraft, 
and the sound of the terrible explosions behind us did not come any closer to us. Again, as our panther creaked and rattled behind the king tiger in the lead, I had the feeling that the reds, for their own reasons, were allowing us to advance towards the Twelfth Army and then the Elbe. Our group was so small that we could see our flanks in the fields on either side, the left and right of each column being guarded by the most able-bodied infantry, mostly the Fallschirmjager or SS men. At times they shouted a warning, and Russian armoured cars appeared in the distance. The red vehicles did not fire on us, and this added to our confusion. The rumour went through the column that the war must be officially over, and that we had missed the momentous announcement. Why else would the Reds stand and observe us without shooting? As the kilometres passed, we became sure that this was the case, that the Reds were now under orders not to fire on us, and our hearts lifted at the thought. We estimated that we had perhaps ten kilometres further to travel before we reached the Twelfth Army's positions, and the corridor that would lead us to the Americans on the Elbe. As we left the cover of a beech wood, we rounded a copse of trees to find a group of German soldiers standing in front of the King Tiger. German troops, my gunner said, with a yell of excitement. We've made it. We are through to the Twelfth. I put a hand on my MP40 remembering the Seidlitz men that had tricked our people at Halbe. Beside me, the Carpo, standing beside the turret, had his pistol ready, and he gave me an order in a low voice to proceed carefully. The panther ground to a halt beside the King Tiger, and we studied the German troops in front of us. They were grimy, unshaven, and their uniforms were ragged. They looked hungry and scared. In answer to our challenge, they said that they were panzer grenadiers of the Twelfth Army, and their insignia matched this unlike the Seidlitz brigades who wore no emblems. They said that the road ahead was mined, and they had been sent to guide any breakout groups through the fields. In five kilometres you will be in the corridor, their Feldwebel called up to us. Many people are passing through there to reach the Americans. Is the war over? we called down. No. But the Reds are going slow today. They had their May Day celebrations last night. They know they have won the war. Lots of red vodka and ladies for them. See there. Two Russian soldiers were asleep under a bush beside the road, surrounded by empty bottles. The German troops had taken their machine pistols as souvenirs. Of course, it was the day after the Great Red Communist Festival, May the 1st, or May Day. It sounded plausible that the Reds would be hung over on this morning, and with the war so close to ending, perhaps they would be less inclined to pursue us. We should make the most of this, the King Tiger commander called to me, before the Reds sober up. We took these Twelfth Army German troops up onto our panzers among the wounded, and we followed their directions. It was mid-morning by now, clear and warm, and the unscarred landscape was full of meadows, orchards and timbered houses. The foot traffic followed behind us, a ragged column stretching for several hundred metres in the bright sunlight, men shouldering their weapons, supporting each other and stumbling in exhaustion. Other men with no guns, walking in a daze, civilians stooping to drink from animal troughs by the gates between the fields. The Twelfth Army soldiers guided us down into a road that ran in a cutting between two higher fields on either side, a sunken road with walls of chalk growing with ferns and wild roses. The scent of these flowers was noticeable even over the stink of the panzer and our bodies. It was a scent that suggested to my exhausted mind that we were finally going home. We halted at the command of the guides, who then jumped off and went ahead on foot to reconnoitre. We'll check for Reds and come back to you, they shouted. We waited, with the engines cut out to save fuel, the King Tiger in front and my Panther behind. There was the contraction of the engines, the moaning of the wounded, the singing of birds and the tramping of feet coming to a halt as the walking column behind us caught up and halted too. The capo, standing on my rear deck and leaning on the turret, wiped his face on his sleeve and muttered a prayer that our journey was over. A few minutes later, a person appeared on the edge of the sunken road. He was an officer, 
his hands on his hips and his pistol holstered. He was Russian. Our troops raised their guns to aim at him, but we held fire as the red officer stared down at us. One by one, other red troops appeared above us on the edges of the cutting. Fresh infantry with almond-coloured faces, clean uniforms, guns that looked straight from the factory. Fifty or sixty of them stood there on either side, looking down on us. I don't know if the two drunken soldiers from under the roadside bush were among them, but I suspected that they were. Finally, one of our German 12th Army guides appeared beside the officer and shouted to us, Comrades, there is no point in fighting any more. The war is not over yet, but it will be over in days or hours. There were jeers and insults from the panzer crews and the troops in the sunken road, but still nobody fired a shot. Listen to me, the German defector shouted. Those people who follow it after you from the Kessel, at the railroad crossing point, remember them? They are all dead. Not one of them is alive this morning. The Russians can do as they please with us these days. And what do they want with us in this column? The capo shouted to the German. Why have they trapped us here? You must understand, the defector shouted back. Among the Russian officers there is competitiveness. The war has become a sport for them. They are playing games with the Germans now. What do they want? I demanded. The panzers, the defector called. Give this red officer your panzers in working order without damage and leave all the women here. You panzer crews and infantry can go on ahead on foot, but you must leave your civilians here. The commander of the SS King Tiger turned around in his cupola to look at me on my panther. We did not speak, but his face was set in stone. He turned back and began speaking to his crew in the hull. Comrades, give them the panzers, the defector pleaded. They want the vehicles in working condition. They want to send them back to Moscow for their parades and their ceremonies, that is all. They will let your men pass through here in return. Even the SS can pass through. This officer is the only Red who will make you this offer. There are other Red officers around who will kill you for sure. Comrades, the war is lost. Accept this offer. The King Tiger started its engine in a sudden roar of fumes and jerked forward a few metres in an aggressive show, making the Russian troops step away from the edge of the sunken channel. The SS Tiger commander stood tall in his cupola, outlined against the sky. I saw the German defector's mouth moving, his hands outstretched as he pleaded with us, and then I told my driver to start up too, and the panther crashed into life in a cloud of oily smoke. I don't know who fired the first shot, but from then on the sunken road became a place of death for us all, German, Russians, soldiers and civilians. Through my engine smoke, I saw a bullet pass through the German defector's head, exiting from the back of his skull in a cloud of red and white against the blue. The red officer beside him was shot through the stomach and doubled up, his face contorted. The Russian troops along the edge of the channel initially stumbled back, perhaps confused by the lack of leadership, but then they clearly decided to perform their duty as their training dictated. They began firing down onto us in the sunken road, raking the panzers and the foot column behind with their machine gun fire. I heard the capo grunt in pain and saw him tumble off the panther, falling among the people on foot who were beginning to scatter up and down the roadway. The capo was hit again, repeatedly, and I knew that there was no hope for him, that he was now one of the many fallen of the Kessel who would surely have no grave or headstone. One of his crewmen leapt down from the panther and went to the capo's side. All that could be done was to remove his iron cross from around his neck, and this was thrown up to me on the panther's deck. In all the danger and confusion, it was a point of honour to us that a dead man's iron cross medal should not fall into enemy hands, but be returned to the wearer's family. The King Tiger in front of us lurched forward again, its tracks demolishing the rose-covered walls of the channel, causing a landslide that brought several red troops tumbling down under our treads. I remained up on the turret roof, and with the capo's iron cross in my hand, I shot at the red soldiers with my MP40, even as the panther crunched forward over the landslide and juddered after the king tiger aiming for the higher ground where this sunken road came up into the meadows. 
Grenades exploded on the rear of the King Tiger, the shrapnel streaming back at my panzer, and I saw the rear deck of the Tiger burn with flame for a moment. That huge 70 tons vehicle leaped up out of the sunken track, its whole front end losing contact with the ground, and then slammed down in the pastures beyond. I saw the commander in his cupola shot through with Russian bullets, his body jerking as he was hit. The King Tiger rolled straight on at 20 kilometers per hour, straight ahead, aiming west, with flames streaming from its engines. Then my Panther II was up on the grassland beside that panzer, and we ploughed forward, side by side, until I told my driver to rotate back and return to the land beside the sunken road. We drove back in a cloud of dust to find the red troops firing down into the path. They were firing off entire magazines and then reloading and firing again. In my hull, the panzer training man opened up with his MP40, and in the turret we depressed the gun elevation and fired off our remaining Koshiel MG bullets at the red troops. We cut them down in a long, sithing motion, throwing them off one side of the channel, and then the other side. I jumped down from the panther with my MP40 and ran to the edge of the sunken road and looked in. The foot column was decimated in there. Infantry, wounded, civilians and horses were jumbled up in heaps of kicking limbs. The able-bodied were emerging from that carnage and running towards my panther, dragging a few civilians and walking wounded with them. In this way, perhaps a hundred people came out of that sunken track and fell in behind the panther as it turned and moved out onto the plain. Walking with them behind the panther, I urged them on men, women and children, shouting at them to speed up as best they could while we stumbled and tripped after the panther as it rattled across the meadow to the west. I could see a copse of trees beyond the meadow, with good dark foliage that might shield us, and I knew that my panther crew would head for that immediately. The King Tiger, however, was still careering away from us over the pasture, with flames pouring around the back of its deck. Overhead there was the scream of aero engines, and the stark profiles of Sturmovics stood against the glare. Three of them were swooping on us, cannon beginning to bark over the noise of the Panther engine. We who were running on foot threw ourselves flat on the sweet grass and saw the red planes pass overhead, one after the other, the three aircraft all aiming for the King Tiger. I do not believe that the Tiger's crew intended to save us, or meant to draw the Russian fire by driving out into the open pasture, trailing smoke. I think it was a matter of those seventy tons travelling at speed, on a downward slope, perhaps with a transmission jammed in gear while the crew compartment filled with fumes. Whatever the cause, the massive King Tiger charged away from us, out on its own, with the body of the commander slumped on the turret and fire flickering around its back plate. The Sturmoviks shot the panzer up with ruthless accuracy, piercing the engine deck and turret roof with their shells. I saw the engine grills fly off in pieces, and large scabs of metal from the turret spin off from the sides. As my column hurried into the comparative safety of the trees, the Jabos turned around and came back for another run. The King Tiger was still moving, leaving a trail of flames and smoke behind it. The cannon shells tore one track off, making the whole vehicle rear up on one side and then slam down, shedding wheels and track links. Still rolling, the hull erupted in a puff of flames until only the colossal gun barrel was visible, emerging from the fireball. Of the crew, there was no sign whatever. We, the survivors of the entire column, now only a hundred infantry and civilians plus my creaking panther, pushed deeper into the pine woods, still heading west. The pine forest was man-made and laid out on a geometric pattern with fire breaks and access roads at regular intervals. Apart from these open fire breaks, which were narrow, the pine trees screened us overhead, although we heard the noise of planes passing over very low at times. The first thing that we encountered, in the first fire break, were the bodies of the same 12th Army German infantrymen, who had led us into the sunken road. They were lying face down, and had all been executed with shots in the back. 
Stepping over their bodies, I climbed back onto the panther to take command of the vehicle for this final stage of the breakout. The panzer was in a hopeless state. The left and right tracks were on different tensions, making the vehicle veer to one side, and the engine grills gave out a constant acrid smoke. I could hear the transmission front drive whining in the hull, and I guessed that it might last another ten or twenty kilometres. Driving down the narrow but evenly surfaced road between the fir trees improved our fuel use, but it also meant that we could not traverse the turret more than a few degrees, as our gun barrel was obstructed by the trees. Only in the junctions between the road and the firebreak channels which ran left and right at intervals of about 1,000 metres could we turn our gun to the side and we soon found that these junctions were to be feared. As we approached the first one, our infantry reconnoitred ahead and gestured to us that the way was clear. We moved the panther forward to the gap, then surged across the few metres of exposure where the firebreak extended into the distance on either side. We paused between the trees beyond to let the foot traffic make the crossing too. The first dozen troops and civilians hurried across, keeping their heads low. As a second group stepped out, shots came from the firebreak to the left, and a civilian man tumbled onto his front and went still. Another shot fellowed a Fallschirmjäger who was helping a wounded woman to cross, and the bullet seemed to pass through him and hit the woman also. She lay, squirming on top of the paratrooper's dead body, until she also was hit by the sniper, her head emitting a cloud of blood before she went limp. I could see no sign of the sniper, no smoke or movements. I had the panther reverse across the open space to form a barrier, and the people surged across in its cover. From inside the turret I heard bullets smacking off our armour plate, and I feared that the Reds would use an anti-tank rifle or rocket launcher on us. We traversed the turret and fired a precious high-explosive round into the trees, which went zigzagging from one tree trunk to another before exploding further down the firebreak. When I saw that the last of the people had crossed, I moved the panther forward. In this way, we crossed three firebreaks, each time losing a handful of people to snipers on the left or right, but each time bringing with us the bulk of the column. At one point the Reds tried to mortar us, but their rounds deflected off the trees before they fell and burst in the air some distance away. Some of our troops were wounded by this shrapnel, and we had to leave them where they fell, still clutching their guns. At the next firebreak we cut the panther's engine entirely, and in the sudden silence I heard shots from behind us, where the wounded had been left. Whether that was a sniper or the wounded killing themselves, it was impossible to say. Finally, we saw the edge of the forest ahead of us, an area of smoke at the end of the forest track, under a clear sky. We did not pause, but accelerated towards it, as we could see red infantry moving between the trees around us, following our progress. When we broke out of the forest itself, we came onto an area of burned ground, still smouldering, which was strewn with wrecked vehicles and charred bodies. A row of Panzer IVs stood there, blackened with fire, lined up as if on an inspection parade. The corpses of their crews were jammed in the hatches, with ravens perched on their limbs. We steered around this spectacle, believing that the corridor held open by the Twelfth Army was now very close. I estimated that it was one kilometre or so, and on either side we heard sporadic fighting, suggesting that the enemy were pushing into the corridor with every moment that passed.